Good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the annual Aims of Education address uh, this year for 2017. The first Aims of Education address was in fact a series of lectures on liberal education held during the 1961-1962 academic year. An important feature of that event was the participation of Robert Maynard, Robert Maynard Hutchins, who returned to campus for the occasion, having been retired from the presidency for nearly a decade. And you remember I talked about Hutchins and his work on Sunday afternoon. Hutchins spoke here in the chapel in the spring of 1962 before an audience as large as this one, and he spoke as he had always done as president in defense of liberal learning. During his presidency, Robert Hutchins gave decisive shape to the traditions and ideals of liberal learning that still animate our college. And it is fitting that we honor his memory and on this occasion and in this chapel. And it is our tradition that the Ames of Education addresses are now published by the college in Hutchins' honor, thanks to generous gifts from alumni and alumni who celebrate his role in shaping our ideals. I should also mention that it's a central feature of this particular ritual that the Ames speaker has given absolutely no instructions or substantive guidance or help or anything from the dean of the college or anyone else other than, other than informing her or him of the time and place at which the lecture will be held. To be invited to deliver the annual Ames address is a considerable honor, but also a daunting challenge. And there's no accident that most, if not all, of the Ames speakers have been colleagues, not only esteemed as foremost scholars, but also as brilliant teachers. Our speaker this evening is Robert Rosner, the William E. Rather Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, the Department of Physics, the Enrico Fermi Institute, the Harris School of Public Policy, and the college. As a theoretical physicist, Bob has devoted much of his distinguished career to the fields of plasma, astrophysics, and computational physics. He's been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and as a foreign member to the Norwegian Academy of Arts and Letters. Yet Bob's accomplishments as a scholar have been amplified by his considerable talents as an administrator. He has served both as chief scientist and as a senior director at the Argonne National Laboratory, and he's led the collaborative effort to found the Center for Astrophysical Thermonuclear Flashes, which has developed path-breaking simulations of exploding stars. More recently, Bob has also been deeply engaged in the study of energy technologies and the range of policy issues that this entails, and he's a founding director of the Energy Policy Institute situated in the Harris School of Public Policy and the Booth School of Business. Bob Rosner is not only a scholar of broad erudition and great analytic power, but he's also a superb teacher who in his time in Chicago has inspired and motivated thousands of students. He has recently taught courses like the physics of stars and stellar systems, computational physics and astrophysics and stellar astronomy and astrophysics. Students routinely give his courses superlative ratings with accolades like, quote, He's a great instructor who is clearly invested in helping non-major students understand the field about which he is so obviously passionate, unquote. Another student notes that Bob makes complex material come alive, quote, it's a real privilege to be taught at theoretical physics by someone so expert and so qualified. I didn't want the lectures to end, unquote. Great teaching lies at the heart of the central purpose of our university. The efforts of our faculty over the past century to create and to define this great university's teaching traditions were often complex, not only because they involved structural formalities, but because they were infused with a strong sense of pride and a profound sense that our work as educators would have a dramatic impact on the resilience of the fundamental values that must define the university. Many years ago, a past Ames of Education lecturer and a distinguished humanist, and I'm honored to say my friend, Professor Jock Weintraub, argued that teaching was not simply a way of valorizing the institution, university's institutional mission, but also a confession of the power of the university in constituting the kind of world that we want to bequeath to the young people who come after us. Quote, a teacher finds his satisfaction, Jock insisted, simply in having raised consciousness by one little notch. It may make all the difference between mediocrity and excellence in the world. The quality of a culture depends ultimately, depends ultimately on this long, this sustained cultivation of sensitivities of refined taste and of sound judgment. There is no cheap, easy way to culture. Much of the true cultural labor is not readily visible, but in this invisible labor, that is to say, in, our, in the work we do with you, lies this great contribution that the university makes to all that is visible to the larger public. The vocation of teaching has come to define the highest and best nature of this institution. 
It's thus a great privilege, pr pleasure and a high honor for me to introduce a great teacher, my distinguished colleague and friend, Bob Rosner, who will deliver the 2017 address on the aims of education. Good evening. Um, I would first like to join Dean Boyer in welcoming you to the University of Chicago and uh, to the tradition of uh, the Ames Lecture. I should tell you that um, giving this lecture is really a great privilege for me. It's not often that I get to give an oration of this type and duration without allowing my audience not to ask me a single question. So I have you in my grasp, and what I hope to accomplish in the next 40 minutes or so is to raise some questions in your own mind about how you will use the things that you learn here at the university over the next four years in the rest of your life. And what I'll do this, this evening is to tell you a story, a story that has had a huge impact in my own life, often in totally unanticipated ways. I should also warn you that given my avocation, I won't be able to resist telling you some bits of physics. And I hope that you don't take that amiss. It's just a reflection of the fact that sometimes I simply fail to control myself. So 75 years ago, a monumentous uh, science achievement happened just a few city blocks away from here on the 2nd of December, 1942. And we are going to commemorate this event during this autumn quarter. culminating with a series of lectures and artistic performances on the 1st and 2nd of December of this year, just a few months from now. You might wonder, why this curious choice of words? Why commemorate and not celebrate this event? I want to tell you about this event, why we've chosen to call this event a commemoration, and why you, having chosen to come to this university, might want to consider whether the story that I'm about to tell you carries some personal meaning for you. I can tell you that it does that for me. So the story I'm about to tell you is about CP1, Chicago Pile Number 1, the experiment demonstrating that nuclear fission, the violent breaking apart of nuclei of atoms, could be understood and could be sustained and controlled. The experiment was conducted right here on this campus, below the bleachers of our then football stadium, where our main library, the Regenstein, stands today. The drivers of the story were experiments by two German chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. And the theoretical explanation of these experiments, the discovery of nuclear fission by the refugee Austrian physicist Lise Meitner, and subsequent experimental confirmation of the theory by your nephew Otto Frisch, all in 1938. What they showed is that if one bombarded an, an uranium atom of atomic mass 235 with a neutron, it could split into a pair of daughter nuclei, such as xenon and strontium, or krypton and barium, releasing both a prodigious amount of energy and, on average, three more neutrons that could then frag continue the fragmentation of the remaining uranium-235, and that is the chain reaction. Now, leading physicists, both in Europe and the United States, immediately realized that this discovery might allow for building a fearsome new weapon and generated a visceral fear among the scientists who, for good reason, had escaped from the Nazis, that Germany might achieve the building of such a bomb first. I think it's really hard for us today to appreciate the depth of this fear that existed then. Interestingly enough, Lise Meitner had been a collaborator of Otto Hahn's in Germany, but as a Jew, she escaped to Stockholm in 1938, just before she did her theoretical work. So she made the discovery in Stockholm. And a foreshadowing of what was to come, and actually what I'm going to be saying, uh, she was horrified about the implications of her own work. She got it, and she refused to join the subsequent efforts in the United States to build a bomb. 
But others saw things differently. Leo Szilard, a prominent Hungarian physicist who had also escaped the Nazis, pushed first the British and then campaigned in the United States to respond to the potential threat of a German atomic bomb. His key step was to convince Albert Einstein to sign a letter to President Roosevelt in August 1939, arguing that time was of the essence and the threat enormous. That threat succeeded in its goal. That letter succeeded. To get the United States government to start what eventually became the Manhattan Project, this was the first big science project that served as a model for other mega projects such as the NASA Apollo, Apollo program to land humans on the moon. But at first, progress in the United States was really very slow. In part, this was because physicists did not yet have a complete understanding of the science, and in part because the enormity of the threat, the enormity of what had to be done, uh, was not yet fully understood in Washington. And so the needed resources were not yet at hand. In the meanwhile, the British had a far greater sense of urgency. By late 1939, physicists Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perls, both Jewish refugees from, from Nazi Germany, and by that time living and working in Great Britain, had estimated that the amount of uranium necessary to sustain a chain reaction was roughly 10 to 100 kilograms for slow neutron bombardment and about one kilogram for fast neutron bombardment. And that made it eminently plausible for such bombs to be carried on an airplane. It scared them enormously. And in 1940, the British Maud Committee had unanimously urged the development of such a bomb in Britain. But the British also understood that only the United States at that time had the potential human, financial, and infrastructure resources to actually carry out such a project and they lobbied fiercely for it in Washington. Thus, on October 9, 1941, President Roosevelt approved the start of what was to become the Manhattan Project. And with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor just two months later, on December 2, 1941, the American entry into World War II, the die was cast. The Manhattan Project started at Columbia University in New York City under the leadership of the emigre Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. The initial timetable for demonstrating a sustained and controlled chain reaction using uranium was breathtakingly ambitious. Arthur Holly Compton, a Nobel laureate and professor of physics here at the University of Chicago, was put in charge of bomb development and was given two weeks to lay out the research plan that would lead to building the first atomic bomb. And on December 18, 1941, Compton proposed that among other tasks, a controlled and sustained chain reaction using uranium would be demonstrated by the beginning of October 1942. Think of the compression of time that they were requiring. Compton also realized that the then ongoing research on fission was too geographically spread. Participating universities included Columbia and Princeton on the East Coast, Chicago in the Midwest, and Berkeley on the West Coast. This fact, plus several key handicaps in the New York location, including a lack of sufficient space uh, uh, near the Columbia University campus and too close proximity to the Atlantic, thus possibly more vulnerable to sabotage, argued for finding a more convenient and safer central location for the project. Compton clearly felt the urgency of moving forward, and he was unafraid of exercising his authority. He declared that Chicago would serve as a central location of the initial science effort, basically for two reasons. Its central location, minimizing travel impacts for scientists coming from both coasts, and the strong support given by the project by the university's administration. As a result, the Manhattan Project moved from Manhattan to Chicago in 1942 within the newly cre uh, created metallurgical laboratory, the Met Lab, located on Ellis Avenue, not far from here, roughly where the Eckhart Research Center is located today. Engineering that move took a great deal of diplomacy on the part of Compton. Moving the project to Chicago also meant moving Enrico Fermi, 
by far the most important physicist involved with the project to Chicago as well. And a reluctant Fermi did in fact move his entire research team to Hyde Park and moved his family as well to a house not far from us on University Avenue. The tasks Fermi set for his team were really deeply challenging. Could they confirm the critical mass estimates of Frisch and Perils? Could they get a chain reaction going? And could they sustain it? And could they control it? Urgency was still in the air, given the fears of German progress on the bomb. And the time schedule had been slightly relaxed by Compton. The controlled chain reaction should now be demonstrated by January of 1943, and a functional atomic bomb delivered by January 1945. The plan to reach criticality, meaning the state of a sustained chain reaction, was iterative. Fermi and his colleagues were initially not sure how big the ultimate reactor would have to be in order to sustain a chain reaction. So they proceeded systematically in a series of steps. The uranium would be layered among 20 pound chunks of graphite, the whole looking like a pile of black bricks, whence the name pile. The uranium served as the fuel, that is the source of both the neutrons and the nuclei that would be split by the neutrons. The graphite served as the moderator, meaning the material that could slow the neutrons down sufficiently so that they would be absorbed by the uranium. And the idea was to build larger and larger such piles and at each stage to monitor how many neutrons would be generated. Now Fermi had actually ori originally started building such piles at Columbia. And in a critical bit of pure luck, or perhaps more likely a bit of genius on the part of Enrico Fermi, discovered what might have been a fatal flaw for the entire project. It turned out that at Columbia, the number of neutrons observed as the piles got bigger and bigger were much less than the theory had predicted. And Fermi had the intuition that there was a problem perhaps some sort of contamination in the commercial graphite that they were using. And indeed, in a lunchtime conversation between Fermi and Leo Gillard with representatives of the company that's supplying the, the graphite, it emerged that this graphite did have a contaminant, namely the element boron. And this was hugely problematic because physicists knew that boron was a superb observer, uh, absorber of neutrons. This fully explained the discrepancy between the observed and predicted number of neutrons. And as a consequence, all of the subsequent graphite provided to the Manhattan Project, including all the graphite delivered here to the United States, uh, to the uh, to, you know, uh, University of Chicago, here in Chicago, were of a special purified form. Now, you might think that this issue of contaminated graphite was a bit of arcana that, that only physicists would find interesting. You know, so what? and you would be really, really wrong. It turns out that the Germans were at the time conducting similar experiments, but they never realized that there was a contamination problem with commercial graphite. And so they decided that that was not the way to go. And instead they chose to use heavy water, meaning water that contained a heavier isotope of hydrogen, deuterium, as the moderator. And this was a fateful pro uh, step for the German nuclear effort because heavy water is far more difficult to obtain than graphite. And because the Allies were successful in both preventing German access to the already existing heavy water supplies, and they managed to severely damage the facilities needed to produce the heavy water, principally in occupied Norway. Th thus, by the 20th of February of 1944, when the last such facility was destroyed in Norway, the German nuclear bomb effort had effectively come to an end. But let's return to Chicago and Fermi's uh, nuclear reactor pile. The target was to build a pile sufficiently large that it could sustain a controlled nuclear chain reaction. And this reactor would contain the key element uranium in the form of 5.4 tons of uranium metal and 45 tons of uranium oxide, as well as large amounts of graphite, 45,000 bricks of purified graphite each brick weighing almost 20 pounds. It was truly going to be a pile, a pile of 360 tons of graphite 
and just over 50 tons of uranium. It was enormous. And this was to be Chicago pile number one. The original location of this reactor was going to be outside the city of Chicago. But because the contractor hired to build the reactor failed to perform, their workforce went on strike, and so work on the reactor had come to a full stop. Enrico Fermi simply decided to build the reactor right here on campus. There's some question whether he asked anybody's permission. It's an interesting side effect. So where was it built? In the largest of the squash courts under the stands of the old Stag Field, what was by then the defunct university football stadium. Who built it? Graduate students and young men hired from the neighborhood surrounding Hyde Park, working under the supervision of Fermi and his physics colleagues. Amazingly enough, one of those neighborhood boys is still alive. Ted Petrie is the last survivor of the people that built CP1 and now, of course, in his mid-90s. I should also add that aside from the work on CP1, the university was a host to a vast variety of other activities related to the bomb project, including a project involving the production and use of plutonium as an alternative to uranium as a fissile bomb material. To give you a sense of the scale of what was going on right here in Hyde Park, Consider that the workforce within the Met Lab here in Hyde Park numbered over 2,000 people by July 1944. That's completely overwhelming all other work being carried out at the university at the time. In some sense, the university was the Met Lab. Buildings housing the Met Lab on our campus occupied over 200,000 square feet, equivalent to about three and a half football fields. And the addition of the 124th Field Artillery Armory which, just, which still stands uh, on, on, on Cottage Grove Avenue, not far from here, provided another 360,000 square feet, or another six and a third uh, football fields of space. This was simply an enormous project. So given that, how long did it take to build CP1? 15 days, working in two 12-hour shifts. And in the afternoon of the 2nd of December, 1942, after one failed start that morning, the experiment succeeded. The Chicago Pile 1 went critical, and a controlled chain reaction ensued at 3.25 p.m. in the afternoon, one month ahead of schedule. So you might well ask at this juncture, what was the point of this experiment? The point was that it demonstrated that we understood the basic physics of nuclear fission at a quantitative level, sufficient to allow teams of physicists and engineers to design and build an atomic bomb. And so we did. By late 1942, Los Alamos, New Mexico, was selected as a site for the bomb design. Two designs emerged in short order, one based on using uranium, the other one using plutonium. The Met Lab outgrew the space allotted to it on campus despite its size. And so by early 1943, some of its activities moved to the suburban location where CP1 was originally supposed to be located. That location served as a site for the design of an entirely new generation of reactors. A huge facility for separating out uranium-235 from the more common isotope U-238 was designed and built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, just south of here. And new reactors were built both in Oak Ridge and at the Hanford site next to Richland, Washington, the latter for producing plutonium. These reactors were all based on designs that originated right here in Chicago at the Met Lab. Four atomic bombs were built, two uranium bombs and two plutonium bombs. And one of the plutonium bombs, codenamed Gadget, was the only one tested before deployment. The uranium bombs were never tested before deployment. The test of Gadget, an experiment called Trinity, conduct, occurred on July 16, 1942, at 5.30 in the morning, at what is today called the White Sands Missile Range, about 35 miles south, southeast of Socorro, New Mexico. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the leader of the bomb effort at Los Alamos, recalled his immediate reaction on seeing the explosion, a line from Bagat yeah, Gita, the Hindu secret text, flashed through his mind. 
Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Indeed, that singular event marked the first time in human history that we managed to fashion a weapon with the capability to eliminate all human life on Earth. What about the remaining three bombs? Two of the bombs were used on Japan. The first and last time that atomic bombs had been, have been used in warfare, and one is kept in reserve and never used. An important aside to the story I'm telling you is that Nazi Germany surrendered unconditionally on the 7th of May, 1945, thus ending the war in Europe. In other words, the first ever deployment of an atomic bomb occurred just about three months after the country that originally had motivated the American nuclear bomb effort had already surrendered. So what then led the United States to continue the atomic bomb project and to deploy two of the bombs? The answer was, in short, the desire to end the war faster, to persuade the remaining Axis power, Japan, that further resistance was futile, and to avoid the loss of American lives if an invasion of the Japanese homeland, homeland islands had to be carried out. But how to deploy them turned out to be highly controversial. Many options were presented and discussed, but how the power of the atomic bombs could be demonstrated. For example, deploying one of the bombs offshore in the vicinity of Tokyo, thus ensuring that the Japanese leadership directly witnessed the destructive power of these weapons. But in the end, the decision was made to use them on two medium-sized cities. Little Boy, a uranium bomb, was exploded on, over Hiroshima on the August 6, 1945, and Fat Man, the last of the plutonium bombs, was exploded over Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. Japan surrendered six days later on August 15, 1945. So was Japan's surrender driven by our deployment of the two bombs? Why drop two bombs? Why was the first bomb not sufficient? These questions engendered additional controversial issues because it turned out that, Japan, that uh, the USSR, the Soviets, declared war on Japan on August 8, 1945, just the day before the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. As you can imagine, the notion that the Soviet entry in the conflict in Asia might have contributed to Japan's surrender was anathema to those that saw our use of atomic bombs as the reason for the Japanese surrender. And there's some that argue that one of our goals was to end the war quickly enough so that we could prevent the USSR from gaining too much advantage in the Japanese war theater. These are controversies that remain contentious even today, and I don't have an easy answer for them. But let's turn the clock back a bit. Return to the Trinity test that demonstrated the destructive power of these weapons and ask how the participants felt about what they had witnessed. We already know how the leader of the bomb project, Oppenheimer, felt, namely a very deep foreboding. I think it's fair to say that the others present at the time of the Trinity test had mixed reactions. In a later interview, Oppenheimer was quoted as saying, we knew that the world would not be the same. A few people laughed. A few people cried. Most people were silent. So while there was elation that Trinity had worked and that the incredible effort that had been mounted succeeded in its goals, in an amazingly short uh, time span, others began to worry about a future in which atomic bombs were a reality and that future had just arrived. So the elation was balanced for many of those present by a but. And for the balance of my time tonight, I'd like to speak about this but. It is this but that led the university to refer to the events that will happen this autumn as a commemoration and not as a celebration. Here are a few questions you might ask yourself at this point. What was the reaction of the scientists who had worked in the Manhattan Project and knew what it was all about at certain key moments? First, when the question of how to target Japan was first discussed. Second, when Germany surrendered 
and the atomic bombs had not yet been deployed in combat. Third, after the two atomic bombs had been dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The historical record shows that opposition to deployment of atomic bombs had already been building among Manhattan Project scientists before the Trinity test, especially here at the University of Chicago. Certainly by late 1944 and early 1945, a number of different suggestions had been made to demonstrate the power of atomic bombs without targeting either civilian or military populations. And many were horrified and spoke out against further work on nuclear weapons after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They had not expected the bombs to be used on civilian targets and had argued against that right from the start. So I'll return to these issues in a moment, but it's important to understand the full context of those times. By then, both the Axis powers and the Allies had already cast aside any reluctance to attack civilian targets. The Germans, in their attack on English cities early in the war, the Japanese in the infamous Nanking massacre in December of 1937, and the Allies in their carpet bombing of German and Japanese cities, which led to enormous firestorms whose casualties were, amazingly enough, comparable to the losses resulting from the atomic bombs. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Nevertheless, the sheer scale of destruction resulting from a single bomb and the long-lasting legacies of radiation sickness and radioactive contamination that followed from the explosion made atomic bombing uniquely horrific. Finally, the ultimate irony of the targets chosen was not lost on anyone. While the bombs were deployed in response to fears about possible German nuclear weapons, in fact, they were used on the Japanese who were not thought to have had any efforts in this direction. And as you can imagine, this raised all sorts of additional questions about possible underlying racism in the decision process that led to the bombing. So now let's return again to Chicago and more specifically ask how Chicago scientists viewed what had transpired in New Mexico and what they did. You see, Chicago scientists had already by the summer of 1944 foreseen that some of the long-range consequences of their work would be far from benign. In correspondences to Professor Compton, then the head of the university's MET lab, they foresaw the great benefits to be gained by exploiting nuclear physics, but also the dangers of a future nuclear arms race. These concerns led Professor Compton to appoint a committee, the nature of academia, chaired by another Chicago Nobel laureate, Professor James Frank, to develop a report to be delivered to the, uh, the uh, Truman administration outlining their concerns. The deliberations of this committee were held in secret, and much of the writing was done by Eugene Rabinovich, a physicist we will shortly encounter again. The report that emerged from these discussions, now referred to as the Frank Report, Frank report was seen was sent to Secretary of War Henry Stimson in June 1945 and was amazingly prescient about the future. It recognized that the secrecy that had enveloped the Manhattan Project could not be maintained forever. It envisaged an arms race in the nuclear end, starting as soon as the secrets leaked out. And it recognized that equilibrium between contending nations owning atomic bombs could only be established once their respective arsenals were sufficiently large that any attack could and would be met with devastating retaliation. This concept is known today as mutually assured destruction, MAD, has in fact been the driver behind American and Russian nuclear doctrine since the start of the Cold War. Finally, the report argued that the American bombs not be used in warfare and offered instead two alternatives. First, that the United States offer a demonstration at some to be determined isolated location to an assembly of representatives of all the United Nations with the aim of its international, internationalizing control of nuclear weapons right from the outset. And second, that the United States simply continue keeping the existence of atomic bombs a secret with the advantage that the United States would always have a head start in atomic bomb development, even should the secret leak out. The Frank Report was, of course, unsolicited. Why was it written? 
because Glenn Seaborg, one of the participants in these discussions and a signer of the report, put it, by an accident of history, we were among the very few who were aware of a new world-threatening peril, and we felt obligated to express our views. What was the reaction in Washington, D.C.? We know that the report was discussed by the so-called Interim Committee, a body appointed by President Truman to advise on the possible deployment of the atomic bombs on June 21st, 1945. We do have evidence that the opinions expressed in this report were at the time unpopular and certainly unwelcomed in Washington, D.C. And we know that the interim committee reported to President Truman that the use of the bombs was unavoidable, and so they were used. The failure of the Frank Report to influence the use of our atomic bombs was, of course, deeply disappointing to the participants. And by the end of the war, a number of Chicago scientists involved with the Manhattan Project decided to organize a means of opening up to the general public, to the general public discussions about nuclear science and nuclear weapons in particular. Led by the aforementioned Eugene Rabinovich and physicist Hyman Goldsmith, this group founded the Atomic Scientists of Chicago, an organization that soon morphed into the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, starting publication in December 1945. While some of you may have not heard of the Bulletin, I suspect most of you might have heard of the Doomsday Clock, which the Bulletin runs. It's located right here on campus, in the same building as the Harris School of Public Policy on 60th Street, just a short distance away from here, just south of here. And this is one of my connections to this history. I am currently co-chair of the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin, a board that discusses and decides on the movement of the Doomsday Clock Minute Hand as an informal way of signaling how dangerous the world is, as determined by a group of nonpartisan experts. Set at seven minutes to midnight at its birth, 1947, it's currently at two and a half minutes to midnight. The furthest from midnight has ever been was in 1991, at the end of the Cold War, when it was reset to 17 minutes before midnight. So we're in dangerous times. Why do I participate? <clears throat> because of my expertise in the areas relevant to the bulletin, and my sense that this participation is a payback for the opportunities I've been given as an immigrant to the United States. I also come from Germany. The Chicago founding scientists of the Bulletin, together with like-minded scientists and topical experts drawn from around the world, aim to push back against the further use of nuclear weapons to ensure the civilian, not military, control of the atomic weaponry and to direct nuclear research in the direction of civilian applications, such as in the realm of medicine, for example, the use of radioisotopes to battle cancer tumors, and energy. And the Bulletin has, in fact, had a powerful role to play in the history of nuclear weapons. For example, it served as a major international forum for discussions about nuclear nonproliferation and arms control in the 1950s through the 1970s, discussions that ultimately led to the Treaty on the Nonproliferation of, uh, of Nuclear Weapons, or the NPT, which entered into force in 1970. While the Bulletin is not and never was part of the University of Chicago, it's an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization. It has maintained close co connections to us, both by virtue of the involvement of the university faculty in its various activities. Indeed, President Hutchins was a major financial supporter of the Bulletin at its birth, and because it's located right here in Hyde Park. More recently, the Bulletin has added a focus on other instances in which human scientific and technological progress has led to conditions that threaten human welfare on this planet. One obvious example is anthropogenically driven climate change, and has served as a forum for discussions on the science underlying climate change, on the means by which climate change might be mitigated, and on the mechanisms by which humankind might adapt to climate change. And as you all know, these are topics that are politically charged, and as before, the Hyde Park spirit lives on. We believe in forthright debate, in airing all the issues, all done with the aim of advancing informed public policy decisions. But what about the MET Lab and all those folks work that worked on the CP1 project? 
and its successors. The push here in Chicago for exploiting nuclear physics for civilian use also resulted in a redirection of the MET lab itself, away from weapons research, and this push was formally initiated by the Jeffries Report, also commissioned by Compton, which strongly recommended this path uh, uh, to the federal government and was sent, in fact, to Washington by Compton on November 18, 1944. These efforts did bear fruit. On July 1, 1946, the Met Lab morphed into the first American National Laboratory, Argonne National Laboratory, located some 25 miles southwest of here and managed since then by our university for the federal government. And that is my other connection to the story, since you heard from Dean Boyer that I was uh, Argonne's chief scientist and lab director a decade ago. One month later, on August 1st, 1946, Truman designed the McMahon Atomic Energy Act, which formally transferred control of atomic energy to the civilian sector, founded the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, and that is the ultimate parent of today's Department of Energy. Most profoundly, it placed all the wherewithal to design and build nuclear weapons into the hands of a civilian federal agency, not the military. Argonne is a civilian national lab and does not do any weapons research. For the first 30 years of its existence, it focused on the civilian application of uh, nuclear energy, designing most of the existing types of light water reactors operating around the world. It was also heavily involved in the science and engineering related to dealing with nuclear waste, and even contributed to the American Navy. The first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, used a reactor designed by Argonne engineers. Nuclear medicine was powerfully influenced by the Manhattan Project since the deleterious uh, biological effects of radiation were recognized early on. And should not there be surprising, therefore, that the Atomic Energy Commission funded the creation of the Argonne Cancer Research Hospital in 1948, located right here in Hyde Park. Ames included the study of producing medically useful radioisotopes, using such uh, isotopes in treating cancer, and carrying out research on tissue damage resulting uh, from exposure to radiation. While Argonne has continued its research in the domains it first focused on, nuclear and particle physics, its scientific and technological focus has, of course, continued to evolve. Today, its research program additionally deals with all matters of energy production, not just nuclear, as well as with computational material sciences, from the basics of energy storage to the molecular structure of biological materials, and a variety of engineering issues such as improved transportation technologies. Again, you might ask, why did I, as a tenured faculty member at this university, go to Argonne as a manager, paying the penalty of reducing my research activities, activities that I've always loved and continue to love? Because I was asked to help navigate Argonne's future by the university, and I felt an obligation to this university that provided the environment in which my research could flourish, and because I believe in Argonne's mission as a federal research laboratory guided by the university in areas that matter to this nation. So what lessons can we draw from all this? Here are my candidates. Perhaps the most important lesson is that at this university, we strive and do speak truth to power. We speak up when we believe it's important to do so. We vigorously defend our views, even in fact, and especially if they are unpopular or politically inconvenient. And we get involved in the issues of the day when we believe we have the expertise to add value in ongoing discussions, especially if the issues involved are related to or an outgrowth of the research that we've been conducting. That is, we hold ourselves responsible and accountable for the consequences of our work as academics. We do not see ourselves as locked up in an ivory tower removed from society. Second, we believe that such involvement can lead to positive changes. Thus, Argonne National Laboratory stands as an exemplar of how concerted effort by involved scientists and engineers can ter really turn swords into plowshares, morphing a weapons program into a civilian research program that aims to improve the human condition. And the bulletin of the atomic scientists, founded originally by my 
Manhattan Project scientists early on proved that provided a forum for discussions of international control of nuclear weapons, a position that was subsequently enshrined in international agreements such as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and the Comprehensive Death Ban Treaty. So this university has long embodied these lessons. They are part and parcel of this university's intellectual fabric, and they have stood well in the past, such as during the, one of the darkest chapters of our nation's political life, the McCarthy period of the late 1940s and late 50s. One of these, this university's proudest moments occurred when the university administration, in the person of uh, President Robert Hutchins, refused to kowtow to Senator McCarthy in the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Sad to say this was not characteristic of all the great research universities in this country. Our university is truly quite special. So the events that will take place this autumn quarter indeed commemorate and do not celebrate the successful experiment to achieve and control nuclear fission. They will serve as a reminder to all of us of both the good and the bad that flowed from that portentous moment when CP1 became critical. And I hope they will also serve as a reminder of the lessons that I've just talked about. So you all might wonder at this point, what does this have to do with me, with you? Well, you'll soon discover, if you have not already, that arguing is the staff of life at this university, and that nothing is sacrosanct, including the opinions that have I expressed in my talk today. You will also shortly discover that we have great expectations of you. We expect that you think deeply about what you're doing, to never blindly accept arguments from authority, and to always question. We expect you consider the consequences of your work. And finally, we expect that you be active, not passive, in responding to issues that matter to you. To speak out, not hold back, especially when such issues threaten societal well-being. Remember that the authors of the Frank Report were not asked for their advice by the federal government. They volunteered their advice, unsolicited, because, as Glenn Seaborg put it, by an accident of history, we were among a very few who were aware of a new world-threatening peril, and we felt obligated to express our views. We hope that you too will feel the same obligation, even when the moment is not quite as momentous as that encountered by the Frank Report scientists. So I'm about to surrender my grasp of you in this hallowed chapel. In a few moments, I will stop talking and you will venture forth to your dorms, and I hope engage in some vigorous discussions. But my most fervent hope is that all of you thrive at this university as you navigate the next four years. It will be a heady time. Enjoy it, and make the most of it. Thank you. I want, to, uh, I want to thank Bob for this um, eloquent and very insightful and I think very relevant and appropriate talk. He's given us a lot to think about, about the power of the universities, the power of science, and the, and the ethical responsibilities that go with the tools that we assemble and we use not only to enlighten ourselves, but hopefully to improve and protect mankind. On behalf of all my colleagues, I wish all of you a very safe, a productive, a vigorous, disciplined, hardworking, and enjoyable year and let's go talk about it. Thank you very much.